Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome once again to the Siege of Vrax, where the Death Court of Krieg is finally getting ready to get back on the offensive after a long and painful year of repeated setbacks and retreats. During the long and trying time, much in the way of ground had been lost. In certain areas, the Death Court of Krieg had been pushed all the way back to what was once the second Vraxian defensive line. And to the north, the Chaos Invaders has pushed the 30th and 1st line corps even further back. Meanwhile, in the centre of the battle line, shielded from the worst of the enemy's attention, the 46th Lion Corps had been able to carry out a relatively well-ordered retreat. And upon reaching what had once been the second Vraxian defensive line, they had dug in their heels and held their ground, having to cede only a portion of their defensive line to the advancing enemies. Further to the south, the 12th Line Corps had also managed to do much the same, an organised retreat where the enemy was held up by smaller skirmish and rearguard formations, after which the 12th Line Corps occupied, reinforced and held the 2nd defensive line against the advancing Vraxians. The 34th Line Corps, however, was not quite so lucky. Being exposed to even more of the enemy's attentions, they were pushed back to the second defensive line and subsequently lost it to yet further Vraxian counterattacks led by Chaos Space Marines. Luckily, once the second defensive line had been reclaimed by the Vraxians, the Chaos Space Marines ceased any further forward momentum. And with the Death Corps digging in once again, the Vraxian offensive, now bereft of their Chaos Space Marine support, were unable to make any further headway against them. This then was the situation at hand when Marshal Arnim Kagori finally arrived in orbit above Vrax and began unloading his reinforcements. First priority went to replacing the losses in the various line corps. Since Marshal Kagori feared that the enemy might seize this opportunity to attack the Death Corps whilst they were still weak, sensing that this might be their last real chance at a swift victory before the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army regained its previous strength. However, the Vaxians were simply too slow. Whilst there was an escalation in frontline activity, no truly organised offensive measures were taken on behalf of the Vraxians, until it was all much too late to have a significant impact upon the reinforcement process. Next in line was the Assault Corps. Whilst the Lion Corps had borne the brunt of the fighting holding the line, the Assault Corps had been no less thinly stretched as they had to rush up and down the front line, closing gaps and regaining terrain wherever it was lost. This rapid pace of high-intensity combat, along with having to move armoured vehicles and tanks long distances under their own power, led to significant mechanical losses in the 8th and 11th Assault Corps. It was as much a miracle as it was thanks to the efforts of the repairs and the recovery crews that the 8th and 11th were even operational at all when Marshal Kagori finally arrived with new tanks and mechanised vehicles. By that point, the assault corps had been reduced from initial strength of 5,000 tanks down to less than 1,000. And finally, there were the replacements for the Bombardment Corps and the Independent Artillery Companies, who had also suffered quite heavily at the hands of the Vraxian traitors. The sudden shift in operations from static line warfare to fluid mobile warfare at the arrival of the Chaos Reinforcements meant that most of the Trojan logistical support vehicles belonging to the various artillery companies and independent formations were all stripped from these formations and moved over to the infantry and the assault corps to ensure that enough ammunition and supplies would reach them. Another huge loss was the fact that the overall logistical command structure required huge quantities of these vehicles to move their own stores of ammunition and supplies around from now dangerously exposed rear line shelters. This meant that the artillery companies had to rely primarily on their Centaur light armoured utility carriers to resupply them and relocate them if needed. 
This last point was of particular concern. For whilst a single Trojan is more than able to move a Earthshaker or Bombard through pretty much any terrain, the Centaur, whilst able to tow these heavy guns on flat terrain, would struggle badly on the blasted and torn landscape of Vrax, requiring teams of two or more Centaurs to pull a single gun. Unfortunately, with the rapid depletion in the numbers of centaurs as well, and the assault corps constantly screaming for replacements for their own mechanized formations, the numbers were simply not available for frequent redeployment of the heavy artillery. And this could be a significant problem indeed. First and foremost, the situation had changed rather rapidly, requiring several Death Corps formations to retreat and relocate to new positions. If sufficient towing vehicles could not be found to evacuate the whole battery, then the surplus of guns had to be destroyed, lest they be left behind and fall into the hands of the advancing traitors. Equally dangerous was the loss of mobility suffered by the heavy artillery batteries. In a war like Vrax, artillery duels are not only commonplace, they are the norm of day-to-day -day activity along the front line. With both sides constantly seeking to reduce the other's number of heavy guns via counter-battery fire. Observers along the front lines equipped with all manners of sophisticated equipment for determining the precise location of enemy batteries will home in on any sound, any flash, and any vox report they can intercept and use these various means to locate the position of enemy artillery batteries, after which this information will be communicated to their own artillery batteries, who will begin firing upon the suspected position of the enemy guns. To put it somewhat bluntly, every single time a gun is fired, anywhere along the kilometre long and winding front line, someone, somewhere, would be listening and watching. And if that gun kept firing from the same position, very soon answering fire would start to rain down upon said position. The guns are of course protected as well as they can be via various reinforced emplacements and dugouts. But, whenever a gun is in such a position, no matter how well defended or concealed it may be, there is always the potential of a lucky hit destroying a valuable heavy artillery piece. To prevent this, artillery batteries operate in kind of the same way as a sniper might, by firing and then relocating to another pre-prepared position, from which it can fire again and once more relocate. Standard operational procedure for the Death Corps of Krieg during a siege is that every battery should have the three prepared positions, between which the artillery battery will move at irregular intervals to throw off the enemy's aim and also to make them question where exactly the artillery's positions are and in which position they may be today. By and large, this is the most effective way to counteract the enemy's effort to destroy one's heavy guns. But, as you can probably imagine, it does require a considerable quantity of vehicles capable of towing heavy artillery pieces from one position to another. This is another reason why every single siege artillery regiment engaged in the conflict on Vrax had several such vehicles mixed into each and every one of the batteries, in addition to the logistical support formation attached to every siege artillery regiment. In theory, this would allow each and every one of the batteries within a siege artillery regiment to relocate itself frequently, and therefore frustrate the enemy's effort to locate and destroy them. But with so many of these vehicles being seconded to the infantry formation, to the logistical formations, and to the assault corps, the batteries could move less and less and less. And whilst, of course, they would attempt to fire as little as possible, both to conserve ammunition and to avoid detection, there were certain scenarios in which not firing was simply not an option. For example, a large-scale general assault upon the Death Corps' front lines. In such a scenario, artillery fire was vital to break up the enemy's formations and help the defenders in the frontline trenches repel the enemy. There was also a certain need for the various batteries to keep up at least a low-level harassing bombardment of the Vraxian front lines and artillery positions, 
so as to not allow the enemy to grow too complacent, or even worse, come to the conclusion that the Death Corps might be running low on vital supplies, which may encourage them to try harder in breaking through a certain sector. And considering the often somewhat precarious position of the Death Corps, that was not something that was to be encouraged. And so, unavoidably, the rate of attrition amongst heavy artillery crews, officers, and their guns rose quite steeply. By the time the reinforcement flotilla finally arrived, the 19th and 21st Bombardment Corps, along with the various independent artillery companies, had been reduced to one-third of their starting strength, from a total of 30,000 guns to less than 10,000. These were some damn depressing figures for Marshal Kagori, who had hoped to be able to reinforce the 88th and quickly launch an offensive and achieve the results that his political opposition was clamouring ever so loudly for. But that would appear to be a pipe dream. Marshal Kagori then decided to do something very bold and very risky indeed. Instead of launching an immediate offensive, he would play for time. In the guise of organising further offensive operations, he would reorganise and reinforce the battered regiments at the front line. New formations would move up in what appeared to be assault positions, only then to run into some form of unfortunate complication, which meant that the offensive had to be called off. Meanwhile, the new formation would take over the position of the old formation, which would be pulled back to realigned positions where they could be reorganised, reinforced, and be given some much needed respite. And of course, the Marshal would be very apologetic for all of this. Oh, I am so sorry, I intended to launch an attack just like you wanted to, of course, as you can see from my plans right here, but the enemy launched an attack further to the south, and I had to redistribute my forces, or the weather was too bad, I simply could not risk moving in such a storm, or there were some problems with the logistical supply system. The Marshal, over his long years of planning and executing operations on virtually all levels of Imperial Guard Command, had built up quite the repertoire of excuses. Nevertheless, some offensive actions had to be launched. <laughs> Not least of all, due to the nature of the troops in which he was in command of. Marshal Kagori had not previously commanded a Death Corps formation, and initially must have assumed that the troops would be thankful for this respite that he was giving them. He received quite a different sort of feedback from his commanders on the ground, however. He was told time and time again that the soldiers were growing restless and impatient with the constant cancellation of offensive operations. Marshal Kagori's own trusted operatives on planet even informed him that there were some murmurings in Death Corps command that whilst Lord Commander Zulka was at best an empty uniform and at worst a uniform propped to the bursting point with bad ideas, at least he let them fight. Gregory then found himself in a rather unusual situation, where he had to balance his troops' obvious and clear need for rest and reorganisation with their equally clear need to throw themselves at the enemy. To avoid any further discontent that could potentially be used by his political rivals against him, Marshal Kagori eventually set up a series of raids that were called preparatory attacks against the enemy's defences. This both allowed him to bring some results, at least, to those in the upper command in Segmentum Obscurus, whilst also making sure that the Death Corps guardsmen never grew too bored in their inactive state. But all good things must eventually come to an end, and there was a limit to Marshal Kagori's efforts to purchase more and yet more time. He had essentially been given a fairly firm deadline that he had to achieve results within two years, one of which, of course, again, had been spent simply just travelling to Vrax. And upon arriving and recognising the extremely precarious position the 88th was in, the second year had also almost been entirely spent preparing his positions 
for the Great Offensive. Marshal Kagori was painfully aware that he would only have one chance at this. If this operation did not result in a major strategic breakthrough, it would undoubtedly be deemed an abject failure, and Marshal Kagori would at best find himself replaced and at worst hauled in front of a court-martial. And so, finally, on 24-98-25 Millennia 41, the Marshal's time finally ran out. He had used every excuse, every reason, every trick in the book, and it was now time to put his trust in the Death Corps of Krieg, the preparations made, and simply let the die fly. The offensive that had been dubbed the Kagori Offensive would start much like any other, with an artillery barrage that would cover the entire front line and last for weeks. Whilst in intensity it paled in comparison to that of the Great Offensive, it was nevertheless a considerable undertaking. With the logistical network reopened, millions upon millions of artillery rounds flowed into the gun breaches of the 88th Siege Army, who dumped them as quickly as they could onto the heads of the enemy defenders. This barrage was to serve two primary purposes. The first, obviously, was to soften up the enemy's defences, and rain as much hell upon them as possible. The second was to confuse the enemy as to where the real attack would actually be launched. During the Great Offensive, Lord Commander Julke had simply ordered all of his formations to throw themselves at the enemy in equal measures thus hoping that his vast superiority in men and personnel would create a breakthrough somewhere, and it didn't really matter where. Marshal Kagori was going to take a somewhat different approach. He would concentrate most of his firepower on one sector of the front line, and the main push would come from the 12th Line Corps whose four siege regiments, the 143rd, 149th, 150th, and 158th, would launch the first wave of assaults, supported by all 22 titans of Legio Astorum and the super-heavy elements of the 8th Assault Corps. In a radical departure from previous doctrines, these super-heavy elements would advance alongside the infantry siege regiments in the initial assault, rather than wait for an initial breakthrough. And when and if such a breakthrough was achieved, the remaining elements of the 8th Assault Corps, consisting of regular armoured and mechanised formations, would then move up to take advantage of it. This would mean that the 8th Assault Corps' mobile elements would be somewhat weakened, but Marshal Kagori was of the opinion that the additional force that the super-heavy elements could exert upon the frontline positions was worth the trade-off. And as for the god machines themselves, their role in all of this was, of course, quite obvious. They were to advance at a safe distance behind the infantry and initially engage any targets of opportunity and then give priority to enemy super-heavy elements and, of course, titans. Advancing at a safe distance behind the infantry would reduce the effective firepower of the Titan battle group, but it also assured that the mighty god machines would be safe from enemy super-heavy weapons, like Shadow Swords or Stormblades. The Adeptus Mechanicus is not fond of risking their god machines unnecessarily, and in this case, both the High Lords of Lucius and Marshal Kagori were in agreement that the Titans should be kept as safe as possible, until the enemy's Titans, obviously the highest priority target on the battlefield, could be located, after which Legio Astorum could engage them in honourable combat against a foe whose destruction was worth risking even their own god machines. The preparatory bombardment increased in intensity in the weeks leading up to the offensive, stepping it up day by day until finally the day before the assault were to begin, every single gun was firing full force and speed, just like during the days of the Great Offensive. And then, with no warning, all of the guns of the 88th Siege Army fell silent at once. And in Sector 5446, Colonel Threon of the 143rd Regiment fired a single red flare up into the Vraxian sky. Moments thereafter, the first companies of the 12th Siege Corps all rose up out of the trenches and began their advance across No Man's Land. 
and as the red flare reached its zenith and started falling slowly back to the ground again, code words flashed across the Vox network. And in the firing trenches of the mortar teams of the 143rd Regiment, the order was given to begin covering bombardments. Mix of high explosive rounds would fall upon the Vraxian forward trenches and smoke rounds would fall in no man's land to cover the advance of the infantry, which was shortly thereafter joined by the Macarius heavy tanks, Baneblade super heavy tanks and Lehman Ross main battle tanks of the 8th Assault Corps, who would be rumbling towards the enemy's lines alongside the infantry, where they would provide fire support and cover for the advancing guardsmen. Further to the rear, High Princeps Aranda Drauka received the word that the Imperial Guard had begun their own offensive. Moments thereafter, he commanded the Engineorum of his Reba-class Titan, the Praetorian, to make power ready for marching speed, and for final weapons checks to be made. The Titan battle group of Lego Asorum would advance to war alongside their Imperial Guard allies. And high above, in orbit, another newcomer to the battlefield of Vrax was also carrying out their own final preparations. Thunderbolts, lightnings and marauder bombers were preparing themselves to be deployed at the request of Death Corps commanders on the ground. Alongside the rest of the front line, the 34th, 46th, 1st and 30th line corps were also mounting their own offensive operations. These would not be as ferocious or pushed as hard as the 12th, but the enemy could not be allowed to focus all the reinforcements on the efforts of the 12th line corps. Therefore, the guardsmen in the rest of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army would also be glad to know that they would see some action this day as well. However, these other line corps would be advancing in the face of heavy and determined enemy resistance, and the advance swiftly bogged down. Whilst there were gains being made here and there, it was all painfully slow, and very much so reminiscent of previous offensives, which had all ended in heavy casualties for the Death Corps. This was, however, entirely to be expected, and Marshal Kigori had not really counted on these offensives achieving much, beyond, of course, ensuring that the enemy could not concentrate their full forces upon the 12th, which was making a remarkably good progress. The metal monstrosities of Lego Astorum were advancing at a steady pace, crushing all resistance in front of them. Wherever the 12th Line Corps ran into determined enemy resistance, they would simply halt and communicate the locations of their enemies to the Lego Astorum, who would swiftly annihilate them in blitzing deluges of devastating firepower. The Vraxians were at a complete loss as to how to counter Duraukas Titans. Their usual tactic of limited counter-assaults whilst holding on to their fixed positions which had worked so well for ten years was now being picked apart and destroyed piece by piece. Static positions that were expected to hold out against the fiercest of assaults for hours disappeared in the blink of an eye. Eventually, they gathered their reserves and attempted a large-scale counter-attack to reach the Titans, but they themselves got bogged down in the armoured elements and infantry of the 12th Line Corps. A massive, sudden armoured and infantry battle then developed inside of the Vraxian's defensive lines. With bunker complexes changing hands every hour and tanks fighting at virtually point-blank range around the wrecks of other tanks and blasted out bunkers. The infantry were locked in vicious hand-to-hand -hand combat with bayonets, swords, shovels and cudgels. The enemy's counterattack had been effectively stopped by the Death Corps infantry and tanks, and now that the enemy's formations were out in the open, this was the moment that the Imperial Aeronautica forces had waited for, as Thunderbolts and fighter bombers screamed down from the heavens and began strafing the enemy's formations in the open with las cannons, auto cannons, and bombs. The Vraxian counterattack had been stopped dead in its tracks. Intermingled and halted by the Death Corps' 12th Company, attacked from above and now stationary in front of the Titans' big guns, they swiftly shattered, and as they began a desperate withdrawal, the 12th Line Corps followed up right behind them, pushing hard to regain the ground lost.
and by the end of the first day, the 12th Lion Corps had pushed all the way back up to the 3rd defensive line, and had by and large reclaimed all of the ground they had previously lost. The direct support of the Titans had clearly proven to be a vital piece, as the Death Corps of Krieg had never before on the planet of Rax made such considerable gains so quickly and so easily. Along the rest of the front line, however, things were faring much like they always had. Minor gains had been made here and there, primarily due to reinforcements being routed southwards and northwards to counter the moves of the 12th Line Corps, but by and large the positions of the 30th, 1st, 46th and 34th Line Corps had barely changed. This, however, did nothing to diminish the accomplishments of the 12th Line Corps, and Marshal Kagori now spotted an opportunity to drive straight through the 3rd defensive line and into the heart of the Vraxian defences. Maybe, just maybe, another great Blitzkrieg push could push through the 3rd line and reach the Citadel. If that could be brought within range of the Titan's guns, there was every chance it could be levelled and the war ended swiftly, as the Citadel contained the vast majority of the Vraxian headquarters personnel and command infrastructure. With its destruction, the rest of the battle line would surely collapse. There was, however, still some worrying elements left. Wherever the Chaos Space Marines had reared their ugly horned heads, the Death Corps had made little gains and in many cases suffered heavy casualties. And the enemy's Titans had still not been spotted. The continued ignorance about their whereabout was a constant point of worry for the Imperial General Staff. There was also the problem of the Nurgle Warbands who continued to use a wide variety of toxic and chemical weapons against the Death Corps of Krieg, inflicting heavy casualties even upon a regiment as used to chemical and biological warfare as the Death Corps. The Corps commanders on the ground requested that they be allowed to respond in kind, and Marshal Kagori, against the advice of many of his staffers, decided to grant permission for the usage of chemical and biological weapons. Marshal Kagori was clearly a fine field marshal, but it is also clear that he lacked a full understanding of the nature of his enemy. He was not fighting mere traitors or even just Chaos Space Marines. He was fighting the worshippers of the plague god Nurgle, and any further efforts to contaminate and poison the land would only make them stronger. On the second day of the Kagori Offensive, the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army continued its offensive. The hope was that the 12th would break through the 3rd defensive line and decapitate the Vraxian leadership. The other corps would continue to push forwards, hoping that the enemy in their desperation would relocate enough reserves to make a breakthrough possible in other sectors as well. But due to the rapid advance of the 12th Corps, its artillery had not yet been able to fully catch up with the advanced elements. Some of the heavy guns had been brought up during the night, but the preparatory bombardment on the second day was a pale shadow of the one that had preceded it the day before. Marshal Kagori sought to make up for the lack in heavy artillery firepower by sending in yet further air attacks, but this time the enemy responded. Soon, thunderbolts and lightnings were twisting and spiralling around in the skies, locked in deadly duels with hellblades and hell talons. Today, however, unlike the previous day, the fighters were merely a distraction. Swooping in after them when they had fully tied up the Chaos Fighters came the Marauder Bombers, who were deployed in a rather unusual fashion. Marshal Kagori had asked for precision strikes upon the enemy's trench lines, not usually the kind of work that Marauders are involved in, being primarily medium to heavy strategic bombers. But due to excellent planning and direction by the aeronautic officers, they were able to swoop down low onto the battlefield and deliver fuse-timed bombs directly into the enemy trenches in low-level attack runs. 
These massive bombs would strike into the soft Vraxian dirt or the permacrete of enemy trenches. Their fuses would ensure that they would bury deep into the enemy's defenses and allow the bombers to pass safely out of their blast range before detonating a second or two thereafter. Waves upon waves of these attacks would be launched throughout the day, and they proved devastatingly effective, clearing out entire trench lines with remarkable accuracy. After the day's fighting was over, Marshal Kagori was so impressed with the achievements of his Marauder bomber pilots that he immediately requested several more squadrons to be seconded to his army. But of course, no matter how good the air support, you still need the foot sloggers to move in and secure the ground. But with such excellent support and the continued aid of the Titan formations, the 12th Line Corps continued to make good gains into the enemy's third line of defences. It appeared as if the first day's successes might just be replicated on the second day, and maybe, just maybe, a swift end to the war was finally within reach. High Princip Drauka's own Titan, the Praetorian had opened the day's scorecard with the elimination of an enemy armoured column, wiping out 11 enemy tanks and a full supporting column of enemy infantry. The presence of the Legio Astorum Titans meant that the enemy had a very hard time repositioning their forces, and an even harder time bringing up reinforcements in any effective manner that would not immediately be spotted by the Titans' powerful augur arrays engaged and destroyed. But on the second day, the Praetorians' augur arrays reported a far more massive contact moving into engagement range. The enemy's titans had finally appeared. Drauka immediately issued the order to all titans in his battle group to immediately reprioritize all weapon batteries onto the enemy's titans. The infantry and armor would have to deal with the enemy on the ground. Legio Astorum had bigger prey to hunt. The engine arm of the Praetorian was immediately ordered to bring the ancient war machine up to full power, void shields to maximum, and weapon batteries should immediately recycle and load fresh ammunition. The battle of the god machines was about to begin. The battle from there on out would essentially be split into two entirely separate arenas. The Titans were entirely focused on one another, and were thusly entirely unable to provide any support to the poor bastards fighting on the ground. In turn, this meant that the 12th Line Corps' progress ground to an almost immediate halt. Deprived of the fire support of their Titans, they were stuck once again battering their heads against the very same defences that had stopped them so many times before. The resulting battle was bloody and grinding in the extreme, the enemy resisting with every resource to prevent the break of the third defensive line, and at the end of the day, only the 143rd Siege Regiment had made any significant inroads. When it comes to the battle between the god machines, they spent the entire day trading fire with one another at long range. The presence of enemy armoured infantry and artillery formations were not a problem as long as they stayed beyond their effective titan-killing ranges and they could do little to affect the outcome of the combat, but they did enforce what was essentially a no-go zone. If any titans got too far into the enemy's engagement range, then they could receive effective support from their ground forces, who would immediately turn their weapons upon the god machine, and it was in just such a situation that the day's one and only casualty was caused. When the Reaver-class Titan Invigila Alpha of Legio Astorum moved too far ahead of its brothers, unable to retreat and shelter behind fresh Titans with their void shields up and ready to deflect further barrages, it was exposed to a continuous and powerful barrage from both enemy Titans and ground-based weaponry. Eventually, a salvo of Vulcan Mega Bolt of Fire overloaded its last remaining Void Shield generator, and before the Invigila Alpha's desperate tech priest could coax the ancient machine back into life, its bridge received a direct hit from a plasma weapon, turning the Reaver class Titan's entire head into a mess of molten slag and metal.
The giant war machine then ground to a halt, still standing and still taking fire from enemy war machines, until finally they realised it was completely incapacitated. The Alpha would remain on the battlefield for the rest of the war, as a massive towering landmark and a warning to other Titan Principes to not get too hot-headed. First Blood had gone to the Traitor Titans, and with the onset of night and the increased risk of enemy activity sneaking up on the Titans, Legio Astorum had to retreat to safe overnight bunkers and leave the enemy in possession of the battlefield. The offensive ground on for a third and a fourth day, with little in the way of progress. The only thing that had changed was that the 143rd Regiment, which had gained a foothold in the enemy's third defensive line on the second day, had managed to further extend and solidify that bridgehead. It was a small sliver of control that promised a potential breakthrough, a promise that Marshal Arnim Kagori hoped to be able to exploit on the fifth day. This would be the all-or-nothing push. The 143rd Regiment would be supported by all of Draukar's Titans, who had been heavily engaged in the last two days of fighting as well with the enemy Traitor Titans. Both sides had been heavily battered over the course of the fighting, but despite the first initial blood going to Legio Volcanum of the Traitor War Machines, Legio Astorum had clawed back a lot of prestige. Over the course of the previous two days of fighting, whilst they had lost yet more god machines, they had inflicted more casualties upon the traitor titans than they had received in return. And so, on the fifth day, despite both battle groups being heavily battered, bruised and scarred, it was Legio Volcanum that eventually had to cede the field, and would not show up for the fifth day of the offensive. The assault began much like any other. Along the entirety of the front line, the 88th was once again assaulting the defenders of Vrax. But when the enemy's titans failed to show up during the first few hours in the engagement, and the titans' augurs showed no potential contacts, Legio Astorum got a bit more bold, and began moving up directly in support of the Death Corps infantry. They were now absorbing the enemy's artillery fire, something the Titans had so far avoided, due to the risk of sustaining casualties from enemy ground fire, which was considered to be a terrible waste of a Titan's firepower. But as the Reavers and Warhounds of Legio Astorum strode forwards, they noted quite quickly that the enemy's barrage was weak and unorganised. Clearly, the preceding four days of non-stop fighting had taken a severe toll upon the defenders, and whilst they would certainly be bringing up reinforcements and replacement machinery from the stores beneath Vrax, the fighting had clearly outstripped their ability to replace their men and materiel. The Titans of Lego Astorum decided that it was worth the risk. The enemy's artillery barrage was not of a nature considered fearsome enough to halt their advance. And so, on the fifth day of the offensive, the Vraxian traitors got to feel the full force of Titan Shock. Buoyed up by the sight of these massive god machines bludgeoning their bloody path through the Vraxian defences, the Death Corps also redoubled their efforts. Soon, Death Rider companies, mechanised personnel carriers, and armoured elements of the Eighth Assault Corps were streaming around the Titan's legs, driving ever deeper into the enemy's defences. At first the enemy held firm, but then they started to whittle away under the waves of assaults by Death Riders, mechanised and armoured elements supported directly by Titans firing straight down atop their stationary positions. Little by little, their positions began to give way, and suddenly, like a dam bursting, the third defensive line broke open and the enemy fled in a mad panic, pursued vigorously by the 8th Assault Corps and Death Rider companies, cutting, blasting, and stabbing them down in their thousands. 
Entire columns of retreating vehicles were reduced to so much slag by Titan's super heavy weaponry, and harried constantly by the air, the enemy's last few remaining formations, desperately fighting a rearguard action, were broken up and annihilated. The rout could now no longer be stopped. The third defensive line had finally been broken by the efforts of Draukas Titans and the 143rd Siege Regiment. Joyously, Colonel Thryan voxed back to his superiors on planet, who immediately contacted Marshal Kagore. The line has broken, sir. The enemy is in disarray and full retreat. We have done it. The final curtain walls are now within sight and range of our weapons. In his command center, Marshal Kagori was punching the air in jubilations. The titans of Legio Astorum had won him the battle. All that remained now was a swift advance by the armored reserves of the 8th Assault Corps and the war would finally be over. Unfortunately, there was one further impediment that no one had counted on. The Braxian defenders had not sat idly by whilst the Death Corps was reorganizing. This was not the first time that the third defensive line had been threatened, and in response to that, the traitors had built yet more defenses between the third defensive line and the final Braxian citadel. This area was now covered with minefields, barbed wire, bunkers, and fields of fire. These positions, although of an improvised nature, lacking the true solidity and depth of planning of the outer defensive line, were still yet another significant impediment that had to be overcome. And over the next few days, repeated vicious counterattack by the Vraxian traitors, now once again led by the traitor titans, halted the advance of the 143rd regiment. Over the next week or so, the 143rd would slowly consolidate their position and make sure that the breakthrough could not be reversed. During this time, the engagements between the Titan forces grew even more ferocious, as the traitors desperately attempted to re-establish their positions. But finally, at the end of the Kagori Offensive, the Death Corps of Krieg could congratulate itself, and Marshal Kagori could breathe a sigh of relief. The results that had been expected of him had well and truly materialized, and his position was for the moment safe. He had achieved what Lord Commander Jolke could not, and the Death Corps of Krieg could once again say that they were winning the war on Vrax. Higori himself took a brief period to celebrate, but soon began planning the second stage of his operations. This was where all of those engineering companies would be put to good use, as even though the enemy was now soon with their backs against the walls with their last bastion in hand, it was nevertheless a powerful fortification in its own right, and it would, in the Marshal's opinion, require breaking in a new and interesting fashion. As for the Titans, Legio Astorum had done all that had been requested of it, and soon Principe Drauka and his Titans would return to Lucia's Forge World with honors. The total cost had been four Reaver class Titans and seven Warhounds. A total of 11 God Machines had been lost, but in return, they claimed a total tally of 12 enemy Titans. A fine score for Legio Astorum, and one worthy of their honor banners. And so, once again, we have come to the end of yet another episode of The Siege of Vrax. I have been Arch, thank you all so much for watching, and if you enjoyed it, please do consider sharing it around to friends and interested parties. Until next time, have a good day.